Hello darlings and welcome back to my channel. My name is Robin Hahn, I'm a professional opera singer, and you've seen the horned helmets, the long blonde braids, and the big fancy theaters covered in gold leaf and crystal chandeliers. But are they the real deal? Is that what opera is really like? Or have you actually been fed a lie through decades of otherwise mainstream media designed to create and feed upon an image of opera you already have for the comedic value of the end result while completely obfuscating the truth? Have you been conned? Well, my friends, it's time to bust some myths. There are many myths about opera floating around nowadays. Public perception of the art form has been shaped by everything from airline commercials to Bugs Bunny and back. And yet, whenever I meet someone new and my job comes up in conversation, people are always full of questions. They want to know more. So if this is you, you've come to the right place. And if you have an opera friend who sent you this video, then don't be offended. Your questions are probably good ones. It's just that that opera friend has probably answered these questions a lot, and sharing this video is just quicker and simpler. That's all. Before we start, if you were looking for a joyful little corner of the internet where we could discuss opera, disability, queerness, cats, and tea, you have found it. And if you weren't looking for it, you have found it anyway. So go hit that subscribe button and ring the little bell so you never miss a video. So without further ado, here are nine opera myths that need a little busting. Myth number one. I won't like opera because I won't understand what's going on. Let's bust this one wide open. Aside from some very, very small indie opera doing performances in new and innovative venues that don't have this feature, the vast majority of operas around the world come with surtitles or supertitles, either projecting a translation of what's being sung across the top of the stage or into a small screen in the seat back in front of you. True story. This even includes operas being performed in your country's official languages, too, since a lot of diction can get really muddy when projected without amplification over long distances, such as an opera, making words more difficult to understand. For those who didn't know, opera is sung without mics, even in those giant theaters. The whole resonance and vibrato thing is what takes care of making sure that the voice gets heard over the orchestra and to the back of the hall. If you have vision loss or other difficulties reading along at pace, including processing issues, I recommend looking up the synopsis of the opera you're going to in advance. Heck, do this even if the supertitles are accessible to you. Operas are just not the type of show where we worry about spoilers. The stories aren't usually that complicated, if I'm gonna be honest. And the audience's ability to connect with what the character is feeling at any given moment is, in general, more important than following the plot points. You don't really need the element of surprise to make the climactic moments in opera powerful, I promise. It's a little like rereading a book or rewatching a TV series. You're not there to find out what happens. You're there to experience the emotional journey. And with some preparation and with the aid of supertitles, if they're helpful to you, you'll understand everything you need to know to have the endings of Boheme or Traviata hit you right in the feels. Of course, that's only if you're watching this in the aftertimes, once people are actually going to the opera again. So if instead you are still in lockdown and there is no indoor entertainment to be found that isn't in your PJs on your TV screen, I promise that most of the opera productions that you can find on YouTube already have subtitles built in too. So go do some Googling and you won't be disappointed. Myth number two, I don't have anything to wear to an opera. Again, this may only apply in a few years time, but... Let's just use our imagination, friends, and pretend that humans go in large crowds to the theater to watch people expectorate on each other. So people go to the opera in jeans. I've seen people in windbreakers sitting right up close to the stage before. Sure, it's much more common to see office garb at an opera performance than it is to see people in their PJs, but you don't need a ball gown and you don't need tops and tails. Though if you wanna wear those things, go ahead. There are no rules about what types of fashion makes you feel good. But often a date night look is the way to go. The delicacies of opera fashion convention do differ from region to region. And in general, European opera goers may arrive a little bit more formally dressed than North American opera goers do. But if you're really stuck, these looks from my Instagram account might be a good place to start. Myth number three, but you don't look like an opera singer. This might be the big one and possibly the one that surprises non-opera folk or newbie opera folk a lot. One of the comments I get most often when I meet non-opera goers for the first time and tell them what I do is that I don't look like what they would expect an opera singer to look like. Well, darlings, I am here to reveal the truth. Opera singers, like so many other artistic groups, actually look like pretty much anybody. Tall, small, curvy, willowy, short-haired, long-haired, younger, older, 
able-bodied or disabled, all races, all genders, and all backgrounds. Anyone can, theoretically, be an opera singer. And I can hear the comment section yelling about the massive issues of systemic fat phobia, ableism, ageism, and racism within opera from here. And that's all true. There's such huge problems, in fact, that opera is only just beginning to tackle that that's actually a whole nother video. I'm gonna do a deep dive into all those things later, I promise, so hang tight. But for now, we're just gonna have a tiny wee little chat about fat phobia and ableism in opera and call it a day, okay? Okay, so, um, fat phobia in opera. Ooh, I thought this video was gonna be chill. <laughs> if what you know about opera singers' bodies is this cartoon, then this might surprise you. But the pressure that exists in the rest of the world that wordlessly tells us that we should look like the people that we see in magazines, on TV, or on television exists within opera too. In fact, people who look more like those magazines archetypes might find themselves being told in the industry that they are more hireable because of the way they look, not necessarily because of the way they sound. Yes, there are wonderful singers who do look like that, but I also know of amazing singers who have either been told explicitly that they need to lose weight to have a career, or have been told that they were not cast in a role because of their weight. I once had an operatic agent that told me that I looked okay, but that I wasn't allowed to gain any weight. True story. On top of that, there are often different pressures on what bodies should look like based on what voice types people are. Really light, high sopranos who often sing comedic roles, like soubrettes or lyric coloratura sopranos, have a particular pressure to be short as well as slender so that they look appropriate for their repertoire. And if you look different from the expected norm for your voice type, sometimes the assumption can be that you're singing the wrong repertoire entirely, even before you open your mouth. Oh yes, darlings, it's that much. This applies to disabled bodies in opera too. The opera world is still unpacking why it only imagines a few types of bodies in certain roles. As a director, I was once asked by an audience member why I had chosen to give a character in a production I directed a limp, when in reality, I just cast a disabled singer because I thought they were good for the role. It didn't occur to the person asking me that I would have just cast someone with mobility issues. If you've been thinking about heading into university for opera though, or otherwise entering the opera world in some way, Please don't let this stop you. The operatic community is pushing back on these age-old norms, and there is space for you, your art, and your voice on stages everywhere in the world. Your voice is valuable. Your art is valuable. No matter what the operatic community has to say about the body that you live in. Myth number four. I won't like opera because it's way too serious and stodgy. Opera is not always tragic. Not every opera ends with a deeply upsetting, violent death that tears young lovers apart. If you think opera is too serious for you or too dark, well, that may be true of some operas, but it isn't true of them all. In fact, I'd guess about half the standard repertoire, the operas that get done regularly, are comedies. And in fact, comedies so silly, they reach the absurd. It's all mistaken identities, slapstick humor, and ridiculous costumes and capers and plans all night long. You're not only expected to laugh out loud, but if you're watching the show live, the singers on stage want you to. They feed off it, they really do. If big, dramatic, 20-hour ring cycles aren't your jam, that is okay. They're not really mine either. Maybe Barber of Seville is more your style. It is a wonderful and absurd show, and if you have ever liked a quirky comedy in your life, then it may be for you. Again, go exploring the free operas on YouTube. There are so many, and I am sure you will find a comedy that you'll love. Myth number five. Those period corsets must be impossible to sing in. Corsets aren't a torture device meant to subjugate women. They were a practical support garment, designed both to create the fashionable shape of whatever time period they're from, with padding and smoke and mirrors mostly, not with tight lacing, but also as practical support for the chestal area. They are no more a torture device than your Victoria's Secret is. Only a very small number of people ever tight-laced their corsets, and it was more like a hobby than a fashion requirement. Furthermore, no one would ever consider wearing their corset or stays without a chemise underneath. That is just begging to get spots that rub and chafe. And that's just simply not practical for long days of corset use. If you want more information on this, check out this video in the card above. Or this one. Or this one. 
I'll link them all in the description. All that said, opera corsets aren't really going for historical accuracy. They're going for that particular production's presentation of that period aesthetic for the purposes of best telling their story. On top of that, opera singers are usually not wearing corsets or stays they've had time to break in, or even that have been fitted to them. They're honestly usually either store-bought under things rather than custom-made like they would have been in ye olden days, or built directly into the costume itself, neither of which are really designed for maximum comfort. So then, how do singers feel about singing in these non-ideal corsetry conditions? I feel like performers are pretty split on whether wearing a tightish corset on stage feels good or not. Some singers I know really like to feel the resistance of the boning against their torso to remind them to really keep their support system stable when they're flopping about on the stage acting or whatnot. And some people want to keep the corset loose to make sure that they feel super free. And it's really up to the performer how tightly they're laced in. But either way, it's not really usually an issue. If you are a singer and you still have problems with corsets digging into you, then you should maybe ask your costumer about the possibility of adding a slip in a breathable material underneath your corset. Polyester will get hot under all those stage lights, but if it's made out of a lightweight fabric, it may be just the thing you need to mitigate that chafe factor. Myth number six. You must have so much natural talent. Mm, not really. <laughs> At least no more natural talent than I would imagine a chemist or a lawyer has before they've been trained for umpteen hours to do that job. Like them, opera singers train very, very hard for a very, very long time. That's all. I personally don't think I came with a particularly magical voice, just a normal one. Then I discovered a passion, and I pursued it. Really hard work on the thing that you really love. The thing that fuels your soul. Won't get you everywhere, but it'll get you pretty far. Myth number seven. You can break glass singing a high note. So I remember an episode of Mythbusters that demonstrated this effect perfectly. It turns out that humans can only break glasses with their voices if they exactly match the resonant frequency of the glass itself which turns out to be somewhere in the tenor range, not the high soprano range. Have you ever seen the video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge rolling and waving before it collapsed in 1940? What's happening in a glass that's about to burst due to the pressure of sound waves is a little bit like that, but on a much smaller scale. The pressure waves match up perfectly with the structure and cause it to start to wobble, then the wobble to start to increase, and then eventually the whole thing just falls apart. Yes, physics commenters, I know I'm oversimplifying, I'm sorry, but this is the best way I know how to explain it. But the TLDR is this. It's not about the note being necessarily super high or loud. It's more about the note being just right to cause the glass to shatter. So even a tenor is very, very unlikely to cause a glass to shatter by accident. The sound has to be just so to do it. And the specific noise that makes that happen isn't actually all that operatic. It's more like a drone. Myth number eight. Opera singers speak all the languages that they sing in. Not necessarily true, though learning Italian, French, and German is, in the long run, recommended for most opera singers. Instead, if we're singing in a language that we're not fluent in, we essentially memorize the repertoire twice. Once with the actual lyrics that we're going to sing on stage, and then again in a literal translation into our most comfortable language so that we can think the meaning of the word at the same time as we sing it. Now, a lot of the vocabulary in operas is archaic, the equivalent of Shakespearean English to our ear today. And it doesn't necessarily translate well into the modern spoken language you would use if you actually went to the country. Sure, after memorizing a lot of operas, you do start to get a handle on some of the vocab, but it's not enough to make a singer fluent. To do that, we need to study the language, take a course, or go to the country like pretty much everybody else. But if you're a singer and you have the opportunity and resources to go study any of the languages your voice type is most likely to sing in, I urge you to do it. Learning a language can be scary as heck, but believe me, in this job, it's super worth it. Myth number nine, opera is boring. Well, in Marriage of Figaro, the Count thinks he's about to pull his cheating wife and her illicit lover from a pagoda, where they're having an illicit tryst. But instead, he pulls out four different people in rapid succession, the last of whom he thinks is his wife, but isn't. In La Chatte Métamorphosée of Femme, a woman works to woo a man by pretending to be his cat, magically turned into a human. In La Bohème, Mosetta makes a whole scene at a cafe, stomps on tables, breaks plates, and runs off with her ex-boyfriend into the crowd following a massive parade that passes by on stage. In Orphéon Enfer, a character literally turns into a fly, like a housefly, and sings a love duet that consists 
almost entirely of buzzing. Later in the same opera, they do the can-can. Yes, that can-can. The one that me saying can-can brought to mind. That tune, that can-can. Aida requires like six live horses on stage, all at once. <laughs> Operas aren't boring. In fact, they're pretty wild. The performers are often really good actors, the music is some of the most intense you've ever heard, and the productions are often really cutting edge and thoughtful. So yeah, when it's safe to do so, you should totally, totally go. So that's it for this video. In summary, operas are very cool and opera singers work very hard. I hope you've learned something new or at least had a lot of fun watching me try and fail not to go on a giant corset rant. Now, these were only some of the myths that I could think of when I jotted the script down yesterday, but I'm sure there are about a million more, so if you can think of any more that I should cover in future, please leave them in a comment down below. And if you enjoyed this little operatic myth-busting fest, like this video down below to let me know. And if you'd like to stick around, please hit the subscribe button and ring the little bell. Keep the comment section full of joy and love, and I will see you in my next video. a little bit too enthusiastic their roller set last night yes there are wonderful s bleh. go away truck either projecting <laughs> i thought i wasn't recording for a second they're going for and this is alliterative here 